Well, at some point this evening, and you might have already heard it, uh, you will hear an infant cry. You will hear a baby get angry, you will hear a toddler get frustrated, and by God's amazing grace, we have a lot of infants and babies and toddlers around Salina First, and there's no child care tonight, there's a family-friendly service, and so you will hear them make their presence known at some point. It's something I'm grateful for the Lord for, of having these kids around Salina First, but the downstream effect is at times our Sunday morning service, they participate in worship and they let their voices be heard. Now, any parent can hear a baby cry and it will immediately take them back to a place. It will take you right back to rocking your children. Maybe it was decades ago, years ago. You can hear it and almost, maybe with a bit of PTSD, you can think, Oh, man, I'm glad it's not mine. And you offer that half-hearted smile to the parent who's trying to shuffle in their child, and you just kind of think, <laughs> and for some of you, it's been long enough that you even have nostalgia about it, or maybe it makes you miss those grandchildren. The cry is just a noise. It's just a child letting everyone else know they're here. There are no words in a cry, but there is tremendous meaning packed in a cry. A baby is telling you a lot by their yell, by their cry, but there are no words in it. And if you've been a parent or you've been around children, you know the different kind of cries they have, and you can tell when some mean one thing or some mean another. It's pretty incredible because there's no words. It's just a sound. There are a lot of sounds in our culture that have no words, but they communicate a lot of meaning. A baby's cry, the emergency siren of a police vehicle or a fire truck, a train whistle. None of those things have words, yet they communicate a lot to you, don't they? You don't hear them and say, well, what are they trying to communicate? You know you've heard the sound and the meaning is packed into the sound. And this Good Friday, I want to introduce you to a new noise. A sound that while there are no words, it should mean a whole lot to you. This Good Friday, I want to introduce you to the sound of salvation. Have you ever wondered what salvation sounds like? Well, in my mind, it's a little bit something like this. And if you're watching online, I set up a mic here. We're going to see if this works out. Otherwise, they're watching online like, I don't know what salvation sounds like. But we'll see here. That, my friends, is the ripping of fabric, the tearing of an old curtain, is the sound of salvation, whether you realize it or not. There are no words, but there is a noise. A curtain tears. Of course, the first time the sound of salvation was heard was that first Friday on the day in which our Lord dies, and the priests that heard it working in the temple likely had no idea what they were listening to. It was probably just a normal Friday for them. They were near the Passover. They would have been coming up on the Sabbath, so they would have been coming into a busy season in the temple. You have to wonder, did the priests know that Jesus was being crucified? Maybe, maybe not. They may have had no idea. Who knows what those priests maybe thought about Jesus, but the sound of salvation is literally written into Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. We read it already tonight, but I want to show you all the different three Gospels that the sound of salvation is written into. It'll be on the screen. Remember, you heard Mark 15, 38. It says, The curtain of the temple was torn from top to bottom. Or Matthew 27, 50. And when Jesus cried out again in a loud voice, he gave up his spirit, and at that moment, the curtain in the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. Or Luke 23, 44 through 45. It was now about noon, and darkness had come over the whole land until three in the afternoon, and the sun stopped shining, and the curtain in the temple was torn in two. The priests are working, and Jesus dies, and it's around it's in the afternoon. And they don't know it. 
There's no radio, there's no email, there's no breaking news bulletin that goes out. All those priests working in the temple would have heard is something like that. A simple sentence or two so important that it is put into three gospel accounts. I read it already. It was the last verse I read, but how many of you noticed the sound of salvation in it? I'm not sure how many, because maybe I'm getting ahead of myself. What is the curtain? Some of you are sitting here like, I have no idea where he is at. What is this curtain? Why was it ripped? Why is it important? Why am I hearing that? How many times are you going to try and rip something into a microphone? If I'm saying that that sound is eternity-altering, it must be pretty important. The Jews that worship God in the temple in Jerusalem, there were many layers to this temple. So I want you to imagine a giant building, bigger than our campus would have been. And in the outer layers, people from all around the globes would have been coming and seeing. It was an incredible building to see. And then there was the outer courtyard where just days before Jesus had overturned tables, people likely were selling things in there from time to time. And anyone could come in. But as you got closer to the center of this temple, less and less people could go, and more and more worship took place. There was this inner place called the holy place. And it was one of the inner places of the temple. It wasn't like the outer courtyards where anyone could go. The holy place was where the priests of God spent the majority of their time. And in the holy place, they would offer sacrifice for the Jewish people. They would come and they'd say, hey, I've sinned and I want to offer a sacrifice to God for forgiveness. And the priests would go into the holy place and they would offer an ash sacrifice or an incense sacrifice in the holy place. And in front of them in the holy place would have been a curtain, a veil, a very ornate curtain, and it served a very important purpose. Behind this curtain was called the holy of holy places. So there was the holy place, and then there's this curtain, this veil, and then there's the holy of holy places. And that was where the Spirit of God dwelt in the temple. And the priests were not allowed to go beyond the curtain. They could operate in the holy place. They could offer sacrifices in the holy place. But beyond the curtain, beyond the veil, that's the holy of holy places. That's where the presence of God dwells. That's where the Ark of the Covenant was. That's where the tablets that held the two, Ten Commandments were, or a jar of manna was. And the priests, they couldn't go back there. Because the presence of God was there, and a sinful priest being made like Adam sinful man could not go beyond the curtain. So the curtain separated perfect God and evil man. The curtain was a reminder. Don't go into the presence of God. It was a reminder of the fall of man. And in the beginning of the Bible, before sin enters into the Bible at all, God and man live in unity. They live in harmony. If you go read Genesis 1 and 2, it is a beautiful picture of God and man living in harmony in the garden. But we get three chapters in before we screw it up as man. We go our own way. We sin. It's a churchy way of saying we stop following what God has called us to do and we start doing what we want to do. We say, Lord, your wisdom, your will is not sufficient. I'll do what I want to do. All of us have done this. All of us fall into sin. And as a result of Adam and Eve's sin, they get kicked out of the garden because holy God could not be in contact with sinful man. So when God calls his people Israel, he says, I want you to put together the temple. And this is exactly how I want it built. And I want my presence to be in there, but there needs to be a curtain. There needs to be a barrier between you and me. Even the priests, even the so-called holy people of God, there needs to be a barrier. And once a year, once a year, the chief priest, the head priest of all of Israel, would go behind the curtain on a day called Yom Kippur. The day of atonement. And they would cover themselves in blood and they would make an offering, a sacrifice with blood for their own sins, recognizing that they had fallen. And then they would go behind the curtain and they would make a sacrifice for all of Israel once a year on Yom Kippur. 
This is how serious they took it. That chief priest would tie a rope around their waist because if they died beyond the curtain, they needed something to pull their body back with because they weren't going in after them because God dwelt beyond the curtain. And sinful man doesn't just go rushing towards the Lord. He is holy. He is righteous. And we lost that opportunity in Genesis 3. The curtain stood as a reminder. It was a physical barrier that represented a spiritual reality, a physical barrier that represents a spiritual reality that one day gets torn. It had stood for hundreds and hundreds of years, this curtain, this barrier. Then one day at the death of Christ, you heard it over and over in the scriptures, and the the curtain is torn from top to bottom. It's not a little rip. It's not a snag. It's not a run. In one moment, at the death of Jesus, from top to bottom, the curtain is torn. Suddenly, the Holy of Holies is open. And the barrier that once separated man and God is no more. Salvation had come that day. And it was not by the blood of goats and bulls. It wasn't by a sacrifice offered by a temple priest, but by the blood of Jesus Christ, the eternal and perfect priest. The reason we call the death of Jesus Christ good is because the curtain is torn. His sacrifice buys us salvation. It triggered the sound of salvation. It triggered a temple curtain being torn, and it gave you and I access to God's presence. There's a book in the New Testament. It's not as widely read as maybe some of the letters are. It's called Hebrews. And it's maybe a little bit more difficult for a bunch of Gentiles for you and I to understand. But for the Jews, it was a really, really important book. And it's still really important because it's written to the Hebrews. And it's all about how Jesus is the Messiah. And how Jesus is the one they've been waiting for. It's clearly a Jewish writer writing to evangelize to the Jews. And it can be hard for you and I to come in and think, what's the big deal without a curtain? So the curtain ripped. I know I get God. Like, I've been praying to God my whole life. And yet the Jews knew how big of a deal it is. So I want to read you a couple sections of Hebrews to try and help you see this evening how big a deal it is that they heard the sound of salvation that day. This is Hebrews 9, 11 through 14. It'll be on the screen. But when Christ came as a high priest of good things that are now already here, he went through a greater and more perfect tabernacle that is not made with human hands, that is to say, that is not part of creation. He did not enter by means of blood of goats and calves, but he entered the most holy place, the holy of holy places, once and for all by his own blood, thus obtaining eternal redemption. The blood of goats and bulls and the ashes of cows sprinkled on those ceremonially unclean sanctified them only outwardly. How much more then will the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself unblemished to God, cleanse us of our consequences that lead to death, our sin, so that we may serve the living God. Jesus is our new high priest. He isn't like the old priest who on Yom Kippur had to make a sacrifice for his own sin before he could deal with the people's sin. Jesus goes holy and unblemished and offers a perfect sacrifice to God. He goes, it says, right into the holy places and offers a blood sacrifice for once and for all, splitting the curtain, thus obtaining you and I redemption. And what does this mean? Chapter 10, 19 through 23, the author says, Therefore, since Christ did this, therefore, brothers and sisters, since we have confidence to enter into the most holy of places by the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way open for us through the curtain that is his body. And since we have a great priest over the house of God, let us draw near to God with a sincere heart and with full assurance that faith brings, having had our hearts sprinkled and cleansed from a guilty conscience and having our bodies washed with pure water, let us hold unswervingly 
to the faith we profess, for we now, for who, he who promised is faithful. Jesus has made the perfect sin offering for you and I so that we can enter in the most holy of places with confidence. That place that only once a year, one priest would go and they would tie a rope around because no one was going after him. That place they would go with fear and with trepidation because sinful man was going near a holy God. Now, because of Jesus, our perfect priest, you and I go with confidence because his blood covers us. It has redeemed us from sin, from our destructive way of life. It has made us right with God. The curtain is torn and we can have a relationship Relationship with God and be in God's holy present. And it's not with timidity. It's not with fear. It's not with a rope tied around our waist. Now instead we approach God and we're telling everyone, come, the curtain is torn. You can go near. And it's not because of anything you've done. It's not because of anything you've earned. It is because of the blood of Jesus. The curtain is torn because of him and what he has done. And indeed, church, today is good news because of that where you and I once could not go where you and I once needed a sinful man to offer a sacrifice going only into the presence of God with fear and trepidation the scriptures say we can now enter with confidence sinful man it says there's a new way of entering it's this body that is broken for you the sound of salvation rung out that day, and we hear it still this day. It's hard because as Christians, you've grown up, likely, praying to God. You've grown up thinking, well, yeah, you know, I get to pray. I, I, I say my prayers before I go to sleep, and Jesus loves me. My mom and my grandma and my dad always told me that. But it wasn't always this way. That prayer you prayed, that connection you have, that unity you have with God was bought at a price. And so it should cause you and I to worship and to say, thank you, Lord. You know, there's a trap for pastors on Easter and Good Friday. We know that they're important days. So we pray and we pray, Lord, what do you want me to say to your people and how do you want me to say it? But there can be a worry with that because in an effort to say something different because we were here last Good Friday and we were here the Friday before that and last Easter and Lord willing we'll be here next Good Friday should he not return or call us home. But I don't want to get lost in the weeds tonight. I want to get super practical. For some of you I understand that you maybe didn't even understand what I was just saying there so I'm going to break it down as simple as possible so you know what it means and why this is indeed a good Friday. So I'm going to close with two simple points. It's, this is the first one. Because the sound of salvation rang out, our sin is paid for. If you get nothing else from tonight, hear this point. Because the sound of salvation rang out, because the curtain is torn, because Jesus died, our sin, our rebellion is paid for. Remember the words of the author of Hebrew. It wasn't paid for for some and not for others. He says that the sacrifice of Jesus Christ, his blood on that cross, is paid for the sacrifice for all sins, past, present, and future. You and I fall into the same trap as Adam and Eve. We can each go our own way at times, and we want to be Lord of our own life. Each one of those choices is sin, and they all amount to a bill we could never pay. We, what would be just would be if the Holy Lord and his righteousness said, hey, there's a curtain. You are on that side, and I am on this side. I will have nothing to do with you. And yet, because salvation ran out on that day, because our sins are paid by the blood of Christ, you and I have complete freedom to go to Christ, no longer bound to hell, no longer dragged down by our own choices, our own wickedness, because Jesus paid the bill. Jesus paid the, the, be, the debt, excuse me. Jesus paid it all. It means you didn't earn it. There is no way, church, hear me, there is no way for you to earn your salvation. If it could have been earned, 
one of those priests would have been doing it. They were following God the best they could. And it was over and over, each sinful person having to offer their own sin sacrifice before they could even help others. Jesus alone is the answer. The curtain stood until Jesus paid the price. But what can happen for Christians is you become so grateful for that, and you're like, man, I know what it cost Jesus. I know he was beaten on my behalf. I know his body was broken on my behalf. So I, I'm just gonna, I'm gonna try and be a really good Christian to pay him back. Like, I'm gonna, I know I'm not gonna earn it, but I'm gonna kind of earn it. Have you ever gone out to lunch with someone or dinner with someone, and they're like, hey, let me pay the bill, but you don't wanna feel like a bum? So you're like, what do you say? Someone say it. I'll get the tip. I'm not a bum. I've got cash. Let me get the tip. And I worry that some of us try and follow Jesus like that. We say, hey, Jesus, I understand that you paid the full bill, but, you know, I'm going to get the tip for you. You got Craig on the case. You're welcome. I'm going to get the tip for you since you paid the bill in church. We can start subconsciously trying to earn our salvation and the problem with that is you are still a broken sinner and i am still a broken sinner so when you fall into sin you can start to question your whole salvation because if you have to earn it when you fail you will start to think i'll never be good enough the good news is you aren't but jesus was that is the truth of the gospel our sin is paid for so you simply live in light of that. You walk in salvation, you walk in holiness, you walk in right living, not to earn your salvation, but rather out of gratitude to Jesus. And then when you fall, when you stumble, when you fail, you repent, you confess, and you follow the Lord again. Last Good Friday, I preached on the scandal of grace and how Jesus saved us, and there's nothing we do with our works and how that, nothing we do with our works to earn it and how that can blow our minds at times. But thanks be to God he didn't ask us to earn it because we never could. Salvation rang out that day and it told us that our sins were paid for. If you hear nothing else tonight, know that you only need to look to Jesus for the forgiveness of your sins. You could never earn it. So because of that, you can walk in freedom and in joy and in lightheartedness with the Lord. The scriptures say you can enter in with confidence to the king. The second practical point and our last point tonight that I want you to hear. Because salvation, the sound of salvation rang out, you no longer need an earthly priest. You can go straight to God the Father. Remember what the author of Hebrews said. You can approach God's throne with confidence. Not timidity, not fear. He's specifically juxtaposing that to how the old priests used to go behind the curtain with fear, with worry, with anxiety. Is God going to strike him dead? You better tie a rope around him. He might die and we'll just drag his body back. And that writer of Hebrews is like, no, 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 no. Because of your new priest, you get to go with confidence. Church, you don't need an earthly priest because you have a perfect eternal priest in Jesus Christ. And just so there is no confusion as to what I'm saying, you don't need me to mediate God to you. You don't need a pastor. You don't need a priest. You don't need a pope. You don't need a holy person. You need no middleman between you and God. And that is incredible news. If you want to speak to God, the curtain has been torn. You can. That's incredible news, church. You don't have to call me when you sin. Be like, Craig, I need you to speak to God on my behalf. I've messed up. I need you to go into the sanctuary and make an offering for me. You can go straight to God. You can confess. You can repent because Jesus is your eternal high priest. And because he is offered a sacrifice, you go right to him. This is really important to me that you know this in Mercer County where a lot of you grew up thinking you had to go to a priest. You do not. You go to Jesus. He is your priest. Now hear me. My job as your pastor is to teach you. My job is hopefully, Lord willing, in some ways to be an example by God's grace of, of walking out Christian faithfulness. 
My job is to be a brother in Christ. My job is to teach you the scriptures and help you to understand them and to walk with you as a brother in the Lord. But hear me, I am a broken sinner just like you. I have no greater access to God than you. And that's good news because I won't always be there for you. And you might just catch me on a really bad day sometimes. I, I struggle. I fail. I ignore phone calls. I ignore texts because I get overwhelmed. And so if you're sitting at home and you're like, I, 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 I can't get a hold of Pastor Craig, you can always get a hold of Jesus. That's an amazing news. Yes, the second point is maybe a little self-serving, but it's the best news you could hear, church. You don't have to rely on Craig. I hope I'm not talking myself out of a job, but it's really good news. And some of you grew up and you thought, well, if I sin, I, I need to go tell someone and they need to forgive me and then they can go to God and, 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 and they have the red phone and they can call God directly on my behalf. You can go to Jesus with confidence. He is the only priest you'll ever need. And on this earth, I hope I point you to him, but I am not your mediator. And thanks be to God because I am broken and sinful and I would be offering sacrifices for myself before I could ever do it for you. So thanks be to God, one time, Jesus made the perfect sacrifice. So now when you leave here, when you're in your car, when you're in your bed tonight, tomorrow, when you wake up, wherever you go, you can approach God's throne with confidence. In church, that is very good news. It cost Jesus everything. Thanks be to God and to him be the glory that you'll never hear the sound of fabric ripping the same. Some of you are going to tear your pants later this year. And I hope you think back to this moment before you get really angry. Because you're going to be sitting there thinking, really? I am saved in Jesus. And in that way, it might be a little better. The curtain is torn. Salvation is wrung out. Our sin is paid. You have an eternal perfect priest in Jesus Christ. Let's pray as the worship team comes forward for one final song. God in heaven, thank you for sending your son Jesus Christ to die on a cross for broken sinners unworthy, but you chose to love us anyways. Lord, would you help us to walk in faithfulness to you and when we fail, would we still remember that you have paid it all, all to you we owe. Your sin had left, our sin had left a crimson stain, but you washed it white as snow. Jesus, we give you the glory and the honor and our gratitude and our praise for all that you have given us and for what your blood has purchased us, for forgiveness of our sins and for being our perfect high priest. God, help us to continue to worship you now. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.